Our reading today is from Exodus, uh, Exodus 20, verse 22 to Exodus 21, verse 11. Laws about altars. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make yourself gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it with hewn stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and on the seventh he shall go free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free, then his master shall bring him, bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, he shall, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Today's passage that uh, my brother Francois just uh, read for us takes place immediately after the Ten Commandments that Pastor Bartley spoke about last week. This section contains a series of additional laws and instructions given by God to Moses for the Israelites to follow. We're going to look at where these laws fit into the context of Exodus, but also what they mean for us as believers today. Why is the law important at this particular time in human history? This really intrigued me when I, when I started thinking about it and studying it. Remember that this is still relatively early. Humanity is still in its infancy. Creation would have been just about 2,500 to 3,000 years before this time. The flood would have been about 1,000 or 15 years earlier. So this is still very early in time, and things have not gone particularly well up to this point since the fall. Humanity, in its early days, clearly needed the law. Think about this. What happened when humanity was left to make its own choices without the law? Well, let's see. Uh, we had the fall of mankind. Murder enter entered the world. There was global wickedness so great that God had to reset the planet and humanity with the flood. And then we had the Tower of Babel. So yeah, things didn't work out so well when we were left to figure it out for ourselves. We need rules to live by, don't we? 
Imagine our society if we simply did not have traffic lights. Just imagine. There would be chaos, anarchy in the street. We wouldn't make it home probably from here tonight. Just take away the street lights and imagine, or the traffic lights, and think about what would happen. Think about kids when they're young. The younger they are, the more kids need clear boundaries and expectations. Things need to be very black and white. Don't do this. Don't do that. If you do that, then this is what will happen. Did you do the thing that I told you not to do? Oh, you did? Okay, no devices. You're grounded. No dessert. We make it pretty clear and pretty simple. We lay down the rules and we make the consequences very direct. As our kids get older, we encourage them to make good choices. We try to equip them with the tools and the information that they need to consider their options and hopefully choose the right one. So in these very early days of humanity, God knows that people need clear laws. So he laid it down for them. That's not to say that the people at this time were primitive or that they lacked intelligence. In fact, I believe very much the opposite. But sin's powerful influence on people during this time was very real. And without the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in God's people and the guarantee of our inheritance, as Paul calls it, humanity needed God's clear law. Of course, the law did another important thing. It created the sacrificial system that gave the children of Israel a way to atone for their sin. And that, of course, foreshadowed the great atoning sacrifice of our Savior. And that's how we end up at the end of Exodus 20 and at today's passage right after the Ten Commandments. If we look back at how the Ten Commandments passage starts, it says this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So before God laid down the law, he was reminding Moses and the children of Israel who he is and why they should be paying attention because they seemed to forget pretty regularly, didn't they? Imagine a people having direct contact with the creator of the universe and they still have to be reminded about who he is. So in this passage in Exodus 20 verse 22, here is God talking alone to Moses and he tells Moses what to say to the people of Israel when he goes back to them. God says to tell them, you have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. In other words, God is reminding Moses and the people who he is and that he has proven himself to them. God is explaining, this is me. Remember me? I'm the real God that spoke to you from heaven. You should be getting this by now. God has proven himself to them over and over again. He caused the plagues that got them freed from slavery. He parted the Red Sea so that they could escape Pharaoh's army. He led them by pillars of cloud and fire. He gave them drinkable water when they had none. He provided manna and quail for food. He gave them more water from a rock. He defeated their enemies, the Amalekites. And he appeared to them at Mount Sinai and shook the mountain just by his presence. But despite all this, God still has to remind them who he is. He is not the same as the gods of Egypt. He isn't a God made of stone. He isn't a silent God. He isn't a God that can't be trusted. He makes it clear, again, you have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You have seen it. Yahweh is a God of patience most of the time. So after giving Moses the Ten Commandments, God gives Moses seven or eight what I'll call amendments that we see laid out here in this passage. Now these first few verses are clear and straightforward enough. Basically, don't make idols of gold or silver. 
When you make an altar, make it using natural stones. Don't use any tools. It's easy to understand the no idols part of these verses. And of course, this is also the very first of the Ten Commandments. God wants it to be clearly understood that this is a non-negotiable. So he's reminding them again. Then there are these three verses with instructions for building altars. What relevance does this have for us? Before we jump into that, just pause and realize that God is being very specific. Let's not gloss over the fact that God is giving instructions. And when God is giving instructions, you should pay attention. He said to build altars, but he says not to use tools. In other words, use the stones in their natural state. What this is focusing in on is worship. And though this is a short section of the passage, it seems that there's a clear message for us in verse 25 about how we approach worship. God is saying not to use tools. For if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. You'll ruin it, essentially. Sometimes we think that dressing up our worship makes it better. In our worship here in this room with lights and sound and a great band, is that more worthy of God's attention than, say, on your back deck or in your car? Most of you know me well enough to know that I love details, especially when it comes to uh, production or events. Every week, uh, we as staff and, and a creative team, we, we spend hours rehearsing, preparing for this Sunday service. Planning, scheduling, transporting equipment, setting it up here every week, doing sound checks, band rehearsal, etc. When we were only doing online church a couple of years ago, we'd spend hours in the studio trying to get all the parts working together for the best possible result each week. A lot of work went into making that happen. There were lights and sound, the live band with all the instruments, graphics, the live streaming and recording, the live chat on Facebook and YouTube, song selection, on-screen lyrics, figuring out where everyone would sit or stand and which microphone they would use, how we would handle transitions from one scene to the next, the background music, speaker slides, announcements, the message, the video monitors, the teleprompters, the photos and videos that you guys would send in that we'd have to get ready to put on the air. There were so many details to make that hour and a half happen every Sunday. This church values details. And to be honest, it's one of the reasons why I feel right at home here, because it's important. We spend time evaluating our Sunday services every Tuesday. We talk through ways to make things better, what works and what doesn't work, what we should do or not do the next time. We're not afraid to try some new things. We're also not afraid to move on if something just isn't working. But this is not about being obsessively compulsive about details. I believe our God deserves excellence in our worship. He deserves our attention to details. But we have to remember that bigger is not better in God's eyes. God demands our obedience, not our religious performance. We're worshiping God, his son, Jesus. We're honoring the Holy Spirit. Let's not get distracted from that. Is a couple of people singing a cappella around a campfire enough for the God of the universe? Of course it is. This passage is a reminder that we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. He doesn't need our fancy tools to give him the worship he deserves or even wants from us. As believers, we can reflect on these laws and the broader biblical perspectives and principles of love, equality, and treating others with dignity to navigate our difficult social issues today. So what do these things have to do with us? When we read about building altars and treatment of slaves and not making idols, 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I just look at these as interesting, but pretty much irrelevant and not personally worth spending much time on. We talked about the Ten Commandments a little this week and last week, but did you know, according to Jewish tradition, the Torah contains 613 commandments? Ten's pretty easy. How about the 613? Jews take their laws pretty seriously. You can find most of them in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There are laws, there are laws about God, prayer, love, brotherhood, sexual relations, the poor, marriage, divorce, and the family, dietary laws, the seasons, business practices, employees, servants, and slaves, vows, the Sabbath, the court and civil law and criminal law, property rights, injury, punishment, restitution, prophecy, idolatry, agriculture, clothing. I'm only halfway through the list, but you get the idea. So what do these things have to do with you and me? Of course, that's an ugly consumerism point of view. We have to guard ourselves against that when we're thinking about the Word of God. But we do need to think about how these Old Testament Jewish laws fit into our church age realities. Let's be clear. Not all laws laid down in the Old Testament have meaning for us today or application. Of course, many of them do, but the truth is some of them just no longer apply. Let me give you an example that might be a little bit controversial, but it's pretty clear in God's Word. Of the Ten Commandments listed in Exodus 20, only nine of them are in the New Testament. Did you know that? Only nine. One of them is not. Does anyone know which one is not? It's the fourth one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's not in the New Testament. The nine others are. So does that mean that the Sabbath doesn't matter anymore? Let's step back for a minute. <clears throat> the Jews were constantly laboring to make themselves acceptable to God. They had to carry out the law, observe festivals, obey a bunch of do's and don'ts of the ceremonial law, the temple law, the civil law. Remember those 613 laws we talked about? There are even more laws not in the Torah, piled on top along the way. Even if you just consider the laws laid out in the Torah, they couldn't possibly keep all those laws. So God provided a system of sin offerings and sacrifices so they could carry those out and come to him for forgiveness, restore fellowship with him, but only temporarily. Just remember that these sacrifices were offered in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross, who was, as Hebrews 10, 12 says, one sacrifice for sins forever. I'm not sure we always realize how dramatic and massive the change is from before Jesus to after Jesus, because we've only experienced it after Jesus. But because of what he did, we, are, we no longer have to labor in law-keeping in order to be justified in the sight of God. Jesus was sent so that we might rest in God and in what he has provided for us through Jesus. Obviously, in Jesus' day, the Sabbath was very much observed among the Jewish people. Jesus didn't deny that it existed. He didn't disrespect its place in society. But you can see over and over again that he didn't hold it in the same value as other laws. In fact, there were times he specifically chose to wait until the Sabbath to do things and perform miracles that he knew would shake up the Pharisees and followers of the Jewish law. He wanted everyone to know that things were different now that he was here specifically to do with the Sabbath. 
The Sabbath and its meaning is something we could spend all day talking about, so I won't dig into it that deeply, but suffice to say, we don't meet on Sundays because the Mosaic law demands that we observe the Sabbath. Certainly not on Sundays. In fact, there is no Old Testament or New Testament basis for having our church services on Sunday. That didn't really become commonplace among Christians until around the second century. So if all that's true, how should we today think about the law of Moses? Let's look at what Paul says in Colossians 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So in light of what Christ did, Paul is explaining that the Colossians were to let no one judge their standing before God on the basis of their observance or non-observance of the Mosaic law. He's saying that the principle of Christian liberty comes into play in these things, not the letter of the law. We aren't to use these things as a test for someone's faith or piety or whether or not we should have fellowship with them. No, Paul makes it clear that we are free from that kind of legalism now. Jesus is our rest. In him we find our rest. He is our Sabbath. We don't have to take a day off for rest because God said so in the Ten Commandments. We gather on Sundays not because of the Ten Commandments, but for our corporate time of worship, for the fellowship of believers, and as we observe the sacraments together. That's why we're here. So we recognize that the law is laid down in the Old Testament, but we also have to see what it means for us today. We need to remember that we are justified by faith, by God's grace, not by the law. If you want to read some more about this, definitely read Galatians 2, where Paul is confronting the church at Galatia about how the law and grace play out. Let's look at Galatians 2, 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul makes it pretty clear here, the law no longer saves us, it no longer defines us, and it no longer controls us. It's Christ alone. Let's read the rest of Galatians 2. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild, rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So in closing, and as the band comes up, I want to look at how Paul says the law was our paedagogos, which in Greek means our guardian or our custodian. The law was given to guide us, to care for us. Galatians uh, 3, 24 to 26 says, Before the coming of faith, of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up under the faith that was to come, would be, sorry, until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So when we look back at the laws and instructions that God gives in this part of Exodus, we can know that these were the things that God knew the children of Israel needed at that time. That's the law. 
None of this means that the Old Testament loses any authority or lacks the quality of being directly applicable to our lives. Paul, in the book of Hebrews, makes great use of the Old Testament. The point is that under the New Covenant, the Mosaic law carries the force as law under the... the, Sorry, the Mosaic law no longer carries the force as law under the Old Covenant. Of course, the Old Testament and the law carries the authority of Scripture. It gives us the prophecies of Christ. It shows us how to live. It provides principles and patterns of wisdom, even while it does not carry the weight of covenantal force over you. The opening lines from the song we are about to sing say this. A thousand times I've failed. Still, your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. I'm thankful that uh, today we are freed from the custody of the law and can live under God's grace and the atonement that we've received through his son. I know I can never live up to the law, no matter how I try. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that the law exists. We're thankful that you love your people so much that you provided them the law, that you gave them a way to still have fellowship with you even after they have disappointed you, forgotten you, questioned you, opposed you even, left you behind for other gods that they made with their hands. Father, we are thankful that you have patience and love for us. We are thankful that the sacrifice of your son is sufficient for us, that we can enjoy the fullness of your grace, that we can live our lives under the power of that grace. Father, we bring ourselves onto the altar as living sacrifices to you. We present ourselves for you to use. We know that we disappoint you. We know that we fail. Help us, Father, to never take your grace for granted, to abuse your grace, to say that we are no longer no longer under the law, but under grace, so you got that covered. Father, protect us from that. Father, we are thankful that today we can be here, worship together, honor you here, at home, in any place, because you inhabit the praises of your people. And we are thankful. We pray this through the power of your Son. Amen. Join us every Sunday at 4 p.m. at 7755 10th Line West in Mississauga. Or visit us online at renewchurch.ca connect.